Hello and welcome and thank you for attending our fourth annual uh, She Suite Leadership Perspectives event. Uh, for those of us joining us for the first time we haven't met, my name is Mark Taylor and I'm privileged to be the Dean of Washu Olin Business School here in St. Louis. And we welcome you to this, this very special event as we honour the many accomplishments and the many contributions of women on International Women's Day, March 8th. And today's She Speak presentation is one of a series of events featuring informative and timely speakers here at Washu Olin, where we are trying to meet you at the gateway of ideas, innovation, and inspiration. Uh, but this one today is, I think, uh, is very special. Because as a school, we understand the importance of supporting women and promoting their leadership in the business world. It's very appropriate that on International Women's Day, I, I mentioned that the applications are now open for this fall's uh, Women's Leadership Forum certification program. And that's, uh, that's a very popular program run through our executive development area. And it's a truly a great experience for women looking to advance the highest levels of corporate leadership. So please be among the first to apply. You can find out more information uh, by clicking the link being shared in the chat now from Alicia. <clears throat> okay, so uh, before we begin, please note that towards the end of the program, uh, we will answer audience questions. The panel will answer audience questions. If you'd like to submit a question at any time throughout the event, please use the Q&A feature on your screen. You should see it at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. Okay, so let's get started. In just a moment, you'll meet uh, the four outstanding women on today's panel. But first, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Stacey Thomas. Stacey is a professor of practice in communication here at Olin. She began her career as a Mandarin translator for the US Air Force, developing techniques to lower cultural barriers and increase intercultural uh, communication effectiveness. She then took her communication expertise to the corporate world leading communication initiatives at biotech and industrial manufacturers, including um, Sigma Aldrich, Emerson Electric, and Life Technologies. And overall, Stacey has uh, something like 15 years of experience in corporate practice, and she loves sharing that expertise with our students. She's an extremely popular professor. She loves sharing that experience in ways that lend practical value to their future employment prospects. So you're in good hands as I pass you to Stacey Thomas. Thank you so much, Dean Taylor. It is such a privilege to be here among these amazing panelists. He's absolutely right. These are remarkable women and I could spend hours speaking with each of them because their ideas and experiences are truly remarkable. And I know that you are here to listen to them. So if you'll give me a moment, I would like to take some time to introduce them. And so let's start please by introducing Ann Anderson. Ann is currently the Vice President of Chemicals at Shell over the Americas region. Since her start at Shell in 2006, she's held a variety of roles across multiple divisions, including aviation and trading and supply. But later this summer, Anne is gonna to move to a new role, SVP of Global Marketing, Growth and Transformation for the new Chemical and Products Division. She started her career as a chemical engineer in manufacturing and technology at Monsanto, then got her MBA right here at WashU. Um, which allowed her to move into business development and marketing areas at Monsanto to become a global marketing manager, and she later joined Honeywell. But today, today is kind of squarely in Anne's sweet spot. Um, promoting the role of women in industry is one of her passions, and she regularly engages events like this that target that goal. She's one of the 50 most influential women in Houston, according to Houston Woman Magazine, and has received the Distinguished Alumni Award from Olin Business School, Washington University in St. Louis, where she completed that MBA. And lives in Houston with her husband and son. And uh, Anne, we are happy to have you here and so glad you survived that Texas storm of the century. Thanks so much for being here. Next, I, I'd like to introduce an entrepreneur and a trailblazer, Kalia Collier. Kalia, um, as far as I'm concerned, has one too many day jobs. <laughs> right now, she is both the GM and owner of the St. Louis Surge women's basketball team. That's part of the Global Women's Basketball Association. And she's the vice president of community relations for the new St. Louis City SC, our major league soccer team here in St. Louis. Kalia was only 23 years old when she built that first, first sustainable women's basketball franchise in St. Louis. And today the surge has a decade 
and two national championships behind him. Kalia is a deeply entrenched St. Louis native, very involved in our community. And so it was natural for her to transition into the opportunity to lead that community relations team at St. Louis City. Um, I would like to go ahead and point out that that is the first majority female owned franchise in the league. And so it's great to have them here in town. Uh, Kalia started playing basketball at the age of five. And if you Google her, it looks like she's never stopped. Um, every picture is Kalia and a basketball. She was a division one recruit in high school and then played both um, at Columbia College in Columbia, Missouri and at Missouri Baptist University. In 2010, she got her Bachelor of Science in Communications from Missouri Baptist. And she's got all the awards. She's a 30 under 30, a power 100. She's won Glamour's Missouri um, Woman of the Year Award and the prestigious Jack Buck Award for Community Impact. So it's such a pleasure to have you join us, Kalia. Next, next let's meet Erin Harkless Moore. Erin is the Investments Director at Pivotal Ventures. That's an investment incubation company created by Melinda Gates to advance social progress in the US. Erin heads the investment team and is responsible for identifying, investing, and managing a diverse portfolio of funds and direct investments that do two key things, drive breakthrough innovations and advance women's power and influence. Prior to joining Pivotal Ventures, Erin was most recently a managing director at Cambridge Associates and has also held positions at Princeton University Investment Company, Summit Rock Advisors, and Goldman Sachs. Erin got her MBA from Harvard Business School and her BSBA magna cum laude from WashU in St. Louis. She's also a CFA charter holder and a member of the CFA Society of Washington, DC. She's native Texan, but currently resides in DC with her husband and two kids. So she missed that Texas storm. Um, we're happy to have you here, Erin. Finally, we have Marcella Hahn. Marcella currently serves as the senior vice president and Chief Communications Officer for Centene Corporation here in St. Louis. In this capacity, Marcella oversees all the strategic communications for the company, including media and public relations, and serving as their uh, main media spokesperson. You're about to find out just how good she is in that role. Um, her latest love is leading the Centene Charitable Foundation. And with that, she's working to ensure substantial contributions to initiatives that improve the quality of life and health in our communities. Prior to Centene, she was the VP of Public Affairs for the Federal Reserve Bank, St. Louis. She under, earned her undergrad from UM St. Louis and her master's degree in economics from Washington University in St. Louis. And if all that's not impressive enough, she serves on the boards for the Arts and Education Council, the Boy Scouts of America Greater St. Louis Area Council, the National Alliance for Hispanic Health, the Opera Theater of St. Louis, and the Olin Business School Center for Finance and Accounting Research. Welcome, Marcella, and thank you all for sharing your time today. And so I'm going to start us off with our first question and to just kind of recap something that Dean Taylor was saying today is March 8th and March 8th every year is International Women's Day. This year, the theme is choose to challenge and that day marks a call to action for accelerating gender equality by actively addressing and challenging instances of gender bias. Um, so as we hear people talk about actively challenging gender bias in the business world, um, my question is, and if you don't mind, I'll start with Kalia. My question is, are we there yet? Do, do women exist in a time where, where they can confidently challenge bias? We're almost there. We're getting there. We're making progress every single day. Uh, and I think it's a testament to all of the trailblazers and women that's come before us. Uh, I always say we stand on the shoulders of giants, uh, but every day we're seeing women continuously make history uh, across every business industry. Uh, every time you turn on the news, you're seeing a new woman has shattered a new glass ceiling. And so uh, as we've made tremendous progress, we still have a long way to go. Uh, that gender equality gap is still too wide than I think more of us would like to see. Uh, and it's time. Uh, this, this movement is happening, Stacey. So I think everyone knows this is a wave that's not going anywhere. Thank you. And I know we are going to hit on that gender equality, the index here in just a little bit. And what are your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, thanks, Stacey. I agree with Kelia. 
that we are getting there. We're not quite there yet, but we are well on our way. I think it's great to see that corporations are starting to have processes and different uh, systems in place to help this. But I also think that uh, it's up to each of us individually to use the chairs that we're sitting in to help progress this further. Yeah, you mentioned something and that's the chair that you're sitting in. And, um, you know, I look forward to kind of talking to you about the chair that you sit in and how um, some of the changes that you've made as you've moved through your career. Erin, how about you? What do you think? Are we there? We're, we're making progress. I would agree with, with Anne and, and Kalia, but I think we definitely have a ways to go specifically in the investment industry, uh, which is where I, I focus my time. And you don't have to look too far uh, in that space to see examples of women tapping out. Um, you know, we just have had our first female CEO of, of City, Citibank, of Citigroup just this year, right? In the past year or so. The fact that you do not have women at the highest echelons in finance and in investing, um, I think shows that there's still a ways to go. Um, and some stats to back that up, only 8% of venture investors in the venture capital space are women, and only 1% of private investment funds are managed by women or people of color. So that's, that's not great, right? There's a lot of uh, room to grow there, uh, and where women should be 50% or more, I think, of, of, of both of those numbers, uh, whether that's you know, women starting their own funds, or ascending to up the ranks at, at other larger financial institutions. And on the other side of that table as well, women starting businesses and getting access to capital. You know, we see some real gaps there as well. So we've come a ways, but we still have a ways to go for sure. Okay, all right. And now let's turn to Marcella. How about it, Centine, what do you think? Sure, well, I would say, I mean, I echo uh, my colleagues' um, remarks. I would say the answer is yes and no. Perhaps the answer is it depends. It depends on the country, it depends on the industry, it depends on the company. And I agree that quite a bit of progress has been made in the US and perhaps other countries around the world, but there is still a lot of work that remains to be done. In the US in particular, I do believe we exist in a time where we can confidently challenge bias and the system has evolved to a certain extent. We have our first woman vice president, we have a woman who's head of treasury, we have women justices, but we're not there yet in some instances. The pipeline is there in many places and it's forming, but work remains to be done. Well, so can I, uh, I would like to continue that conversation with you there for just a second, if you don't mind, Marcella. Sure. And um, Centene in particular recently landed a place um, on Bloomberg's gender, gender equality index. Um, you know, and that particular index addresses one of the difficulties in achieving equality, which is, um, and it's something that you sort of hit on, it's different across countries. So um, it's simply agreeing on a standardized version of equality and what that looks like. So um, what do you think, you know, being, being at Centene, a company that's doing well in this area, um, what do you think gender equality in the workplace looks like? Yeah, you know, you mentioned, Stacey, this is actually our third consecutive year that something has been selected by Bloomberg as one of the companies recognized. And this is a global leadership uh, recognition of advancing women in the workplace, uh, represented our 44 countries around the world. Uh, at Centene, at our highest leadership levels, we are honored to have Jessica Bloom and Lori Robinson serve on our board of directors. Jessica Bloom is a retired vice chair of Deloitte and Lori Robinson is a retired four-star United States Air Force General with a 36 year military career. And then if you look at our workforce, women represent 75% of our employees, 64% in supervisory positions and 55% at the director level and above. So I guess I would ask the question, is that gender equality? Or perhaps is it inequality since this is not 50-50? So I guess my main point here would be that it, perhaps it's not really about the number 50-50, uh, since in our case, women are the majority at Centene. But I think equality in the workforce means more about having the choice, the access, and the opportunity to perceive whatever we want to, perceive, to pursue based on our qualifications and experience, and not necessarily based on our gender or our ethnicity. It is about being able to level the playing field and giving opportunity to anyone who wants to seek these positions. Our CEO likes to say that at Centene, everyone is in their position, 
not because they are a man or a woman, a minority, etc. They are in that position because they are the best person for the job. That speaks to me. I want to be in my position, not because I'm Hispanic or a woman. I want to lead in my role with the confidence that I was selected because of my skill set and my experience and my qualifications. And in reality, it is about maybe leveling the playing field, having systems in place to provide access and opportunity to everyone. Maternity and paternity leave are some key systems that we have to have in place, right? And making it acceptable to balance your family life and your professional life. Yeah, and I think, you know, maybe COVID has made that something, and it, it, perhaps we'll have some time to talk about that later, right, of whether that's helped to level the playing field or not. Um, and it's interesting, you know, that, that Centimba's numbers are startling, and if you don't mind, I'm going to take this, I want to flip it over to Anne for just a second, um, because Anne, you have this, you have this background in chemical engineering, and so, um, and you started, was that maybe in the early 90s? But either way, you witnessed this hefty evolutionary phase in equality in what are historically male-dominated STEM fields. Um, but this year's theme, Choose to Challenge, how would you advise a person to, to approach a situation in which they felt maybe their organizational leadership had missed the mark on equality? And you know, maybe you have a good story um, of someone that you've seen or maybe that you've done this yourself, successfully advocating for change at that organizational level. Yeah, thanks, Stacy. So it is uh, quite interesting when you're in the oil and gas industry and chemical industry that uh, you do tend to run across um, a lot more men than women, and especially in technical or, or some of the base business fields. But it's quite exciting that the industry has changed pretty dramatically over the past few years. We do have uh, women oil and gas CEOs. Uh, Lynn Elson Hans, who's an ex-Shell employee, um, went on to be the CEO of one of the competitive oil companies. And uh, we have now um, another Shell alumni who is running uh, Selenese, which is one of the big chemical companies, female. So, um, so you do see that uh, shifting and you do see the numbers in oil and gas continue to increase. We're at about 30% women today. And uh, the aspiration of course is to get uh, to gender balance. When you talk about challenging though, it's quite interesting because statistics say that women are 50% more likely to stand up and uh, challenge both bias, gender, um, any sort of diversity issues in the workforce, whereas 40% of men will. And so women are actually quite uh, large advocates for um, not only championing these causes, but also helping. And when you look at mentoring and you see, you know, who also is in the mentoring space, women are one and a half times more likely to mentor others than are men. And so not only are we bringing the challenge into the room, but we're also helping others to think through issues and problems that they might be facing. So when I look at, uh, you know, how we do that successfully within Shell, um, we're actually going through that right now in real time. So for those who don't know, Shell is uh, undergoing a massive change right now. We have approximately 83,000 employees. Um, our CEO came out in May of last year on a journey to uh, move the company from traditional oil and gas to the energy transition. In light of that, we are fundamentally restructuring the business, not for purposes of downgrading or, or losing people from the organization, but to really focus the jobs on the energy transition. In light of that, we have over 15,000 jobs that are getting ready to be restaffed in the next few months. And, uh, and so we have a lot of choices to be making around how we are putting people both of uh, female and other types of diversity into these chairs. And so we've already started that process. And in the course of you know, the initial conversations, I personally took a stand that said, I want at least 50% of my new leadership team to be uh, female or diverse candidates across the board. And I'm happy to report, although the names haven't been announced yet, that I've achieved 70% female representation on my leadership team. So I am super excited the outcome of, uh, of it. In fact, we had to have the opposite conversation to say, where will we put a white male back on the team to uh, make sure that we didn't make the pendulum swing ultimately in the opposite direction. 
But to do that, you know, it's it's quite a, a bold statement because you're in the middle of, you know, massive reorganization. You have a lot of people who are watching what you're doing and you have, of course, leaders who are highly vested in the outcome. And so making sure that you continue to stand your ground is something that uh, I mentioned at the beginning. When you have a chair that's of this level, you have to be able to use it and use it as a power for good. And I firmly believe that that's, uh, that's my role in this reorg is to make sure that the outcome is what we want it to be. I love that um, that this is happening. And I think, you know, it's it's fortuitous. There's a good measure of this that's possible because of a business change, right? Um, but I think what I'm hearing you say is that in so many ways, we're laying the, the groundwork correctly to make this happen. Um, and so if we take this and we kind of move it to the flip side, Erin, um, if you don't mind, I would like to ask you, uh, and then, you know, maybe get some insight from some of our other panelists on that, on that flip side, if we bring this down to the individual level, what mistakes do you see women make when they're advocating for themselves? And now that could be in selling, just selling their ideas in the conference room or asking for promotion or raise and, you know, what do men do differently? Sure. No, I, I point to two, two things, um, or two, two, two mistakes that sort of fall into the buckets of, um, perfection or pursuit of perfection and minimization. Um, and I've seen uh, directly in, you know, conversations with male colleagues uh, and or in managing folks that the, you know, women feel and often um, try and have every T crossed, every I dotted before they come with the ask. So that, that idea of it has to be perfect. I have to have all my ducks in a row. And as a, a live a, you know, anecdote, in the, in the past, I had a male colleague who literally just like uh, talked to a very senior person at our firm and just put an idea in front of him and was like, hey, what do you think about this? I want to go try this. And I was t chatting with him about that uh, after the fact. I said, well, did you prep? Like, were you ready for that conversation? And he was like, I just sort of went with it. Like I, 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 I had five minutes with him and I made, made my pitch and it worked. And, and not that women don't do that, but I think, you know, even from a young age, you know, we're, we're sort of pushed in that with that mindset. So that would be one thing. And then the second is this minimization and, you know, not feeling comfortable pulling on other threads or strands of experience that you may have that don't seem as directly perhaps your main or applicable to what's happening, um, you know, happening in the, in the room. Um, so, you know, one live example of that too is I think, you know, those of us that are caregivers, moms caring for, for parents, organizing a household, you know, those are all skills that are really valuable in uh, managing your team, managing a business unit, uh, running a fund. And I think because we don't see it as being, you know, spot on, we're reluctant to call that out. And, and those are, you know, maybe outside of your core day-to-day -day function, but, you know, they're all examples of things that you're doing uh, that could make you a compelling candidate for a role or for a transition in your company. So, so not being shy about, I think, advocating for yourself and all the ways that the fullness of your experience comes, comes to light. Um, you know, men have no problem I've found in, in my experience with, with self-promotion in ways that, <laughs> that, that women may not. Well, and I wonder too, you know, you mentioned that men kind of tend to take a more casual approach in this respect. And I wonder if that, you know, if that maybe takes the pressure off. And so it's not an immediate um, effort to try and pick apart the case, if you will. Right, um, right, right. So Marcella, what do you think about this? What mistakes do you see women make when advocating for I themselves? Mention, sure, I would mention three that immediately come to mind. Number one, imposter syndrome. Number two, women don't ask. And number three, being hesitant to take risks and fail. So imposter syndrome is actually more prevalent in women than in men. And I think something that is essential is we need to believe in ourselves. If we don't give ourselves credit, we can't expect others uh, to recognize our achievements. We expect to be noticed and recognized, but uh, there is a fine balance you can, you can achieve when you demonstrate that you achieve results. And it's not being braggy or uh, aggressive, uh, but I do think we tend to minimize our success as Erin mentioned. And then the, the second one is women don't ask. I've, I've spent quite a bit of my career recruiting uh, for different positions in communications departments. I'm sorry, I'm gonna stand up because my light turned off, so apologies. Uh, but 
oftentimes in my career, I've experienced men who negotiate salary and uh, that typically does not happen with women. I've had maybe one or two instances when a woman would negotiate salary and secretly inside I'm cheering and rooting for her uh, for being, being um, able to, to negotiate. So we need to ask. Uh, and the worst thing that can happen is that we're told no, but, uh, but nothing will happen if we don't ask. Uh, and then finally, being hesitant to take risks and fail. I think um, we, we need to be willing to take risks. Obviously, we want to take measured risks and uh, be prepared, but it's okay to fail. And typically, we learn more from our failures than we learn from our successes. And so, you know, honestly, I think that that point there, learning more from our failures, obviously pain, shame, fear, and failure tend to be amazing teachers. And with that in mind, um, Kalia. <laughs> is a big believer <laughs> in the value of, of successes and failures. Um, but what mistakes are you seeing, Clea, whether it's, you know, whether it's with, with female athletes or, or business people, what are you seeing um, women do that we could do better? You know, Aaron and Marcella have, have talked about, you know, points we've all seen. Uh, in truth, it, it, it all equates back to not knowing our value and not feeling confident in our value and what we bring to the table. And that's a huge proponent. Uh, we don't ask enough. And being able to tell your whole story and be bold and be confident uh, and kind of skate that line of confidence and arrogance, it's okay. Uh, we, we see our counterparts do it all the time. When you talk about imposter syndrome, I've seen enough men, especially in the sports realm and investment realm that walk in like they have it all together and they're barely passing. Uh, but they come in uh, like they've gotten extra credit. Like, and so we, we know what that looks like. And I think that's a, a huge uh, difference too with women who, have, who are competitive, that's played sports, that consider themselves as, as athletes. There's a, a part of this mindset that you also have to coach yourself into. Uh, coaching yourself into, you know what, I'm here. Not only am I qualified, typically we're overqualified uh, and we've worked so hard to be where we are today. Let's not undermine our own success. And so I think that that's really good advice in um, in a situation like this, because we really are in um, in a pro female environment. We have probably more opportunity than we've ever had in here in the U.S. Uh, but we remain women remain um, uncomfortable with power in many cases, and it's a catch twenty two because there's this like you know there's this fine line between being a leader and alienating people or pissing them off, and that's something that you were talking about. And so um, why do you think women are uncomfortable with power. And what do we do? I mean, how do you get comfortable with that feeling of power and recognize that it's not imposter syndrome? Do you have any tips on what exactly we should do? Stacy? the other piece of that is practice. Uh, <laughs> you know, coming from the, the sports room, you get used to things of being in the position when you are familiar and comfortable and have the opportunity to be in that role. So there are men that have, they've had more of an opportunity to be in power. So they are a little bit more comfortable in that space. Uh, and I think those are the things that we coach ourselves on, especially I have a tremendous amount of respect uh, for moms. You, you are already leading, you're already in power <laughs> and this leadership role. And then you take that into managing a team, coaching a team or whatever it may be and using those skill sets and applying them as you grow in your career. Uh, I think it's mm -hmm. something that we also don't kind of do that that the evolution of our own uh, growth, which is a part of, it's a part of the process. It is a part of the process. And um, I'm actually, I'm gonna go to Anne on this one because, um, or I'm sorry, let's go to, I'm gonna ask Marcella because Marcella, I think you had said to me one time something about the need to elevate other women, to connect with other women and elevate women. And um, do you feel like that that's something that comes into play here when it comes to these situations of, of figuring out your space between being a leader and being someone who's just annoying. I think so, and you know, I think uh, perhaps one of, one of the challenges that we face as women is just culture and society, right? From childhood, we've been taught to collaborate, to sacrifice, to make sure everybody wins. And it is possible to be a woman and to succeed. My father used to say to me, say with flowers, you don't have to be combative or aggressive. You can be assertive and constructive. Uh, but we do need to speak up. And then also leveraging a network. 
women can elevate women, right? Uh, I think personally, one of the secrets to my success uh, throughout my career has been having a strong network of female uh, friends, both uh, my, my kids, uh, I have twins, and uh, since kindergarten, this group of working moms form, and we have been friends since. My kids went to college uh, last fall. Uh, so having a strong network where you support each other, we would plan summer camps together, and we would do carpool and bring chicken soup if you were sick. Then here at Santina as well, with a senior uh, female leadership team to support one another, to elevate one another, to mentor, coach, uh, collaborate and celebrate each other's successes. So I, I think uh, we need to work together to, to elevate one another. Thank you. And let me um, spin this one over to you. So what pros and cons, and with respect to this, do you think women should be considering as, as they rise through the ranks, much like you have? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's exactly, you know, what my colleagues here have said, which is, um, you know, first it's putting yourself into the room and practice. Um, ask for those opportunities. Um, you know, women are not naturally the people who will go and ask, can I sh job shadow a CEO? Can I, you know, go with a senior person to a negotiation? Can I participate in whatever's happening at the moment? Um, you know, they tend to wait to be asked as opposed to volunteering. And so I see more and more that that's something that's, you know, creating those opportunities for yourself has been a really uh, positive um, for people's careers. And we, you know, we spoke about the other day in our company, you know, many of the senior leaders have senior business advisors. And traditionally, these roles were um, given to men. And they're the you know, opportunity for the very front line to get very comfortable with managing around senior executives. And it gives you a chance to see who's your up and coming talent. And uh, one of the dynamics that we realized needed to shift was that you know, women would typically not ask for those roles because they tend to be one, um, not on a normal schedule, you know, if the senior business lead is doing, you know, deals or working on projects, they tend to be, you know, non-traditional work hours. They also tend to potentially include travel, depending who the senior business leader is. Now, um, certainly not in COVID environment, but hopefully we get back there someday. Um, or, you know, uh, non-traditional, you know, again, non-traditional hours, you work on the world, many of our jobs are global. And so we take calls, you know, at 6am or, you know, 8pm at night. And, um, and so it's getting over those types of, um, and finding a way to fit your personal life around that, to recognize, you know, nobody, very few people in the, um, in the oil and gas industry work eight to five. We all work, you know, non-traditional schedules. And so I take off in the middle of the day to go pick up my children at school. And, um, but then I'm back on calls, you know, in the evening. And so having that comfort level to take on those types of risks and those types of of jobs that are high visibility, high profile, but also help get you through is, is quite, uh, quite a valuable opportunity for people. And I think it is, it's tough. If I tie all of this together, I'm hearing we need to take those opportunities and yet those are really intimidating opportunities and, and high profile opportunities to, to mess up. Erin, um, do you mind if I ask you the very same question? Um, how do we balance this fine line between being a leader and alienating? Sure. No, I mean, it's a constant tension that I think, you know, for all the things that my fellow panelists said, you know, how women are, how we are sort of conditioned to behave mm -hmm. or how we think we should show up. Uh, and then what the archetype is, you know, when you Google CEO or what images come up, you see a man, you see a, a, a you know, power has that um, image behind it. And, and it doesn't necessarily tie, you know, directly back to women. So I think it, it's definitely something that um, you know, we have to struggle against. But I would echo what, what, what others have said. You, know, you have to be true to yourself. It's too hard to not be authentically you. Uh, and figuring out a way to bring your best self, but also you know, deliver on the demands of the job, I think is, 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 is the advice I would give. And honing in on, I think what, I, again, I also heard from my other panelists, maybe tying it together, which I've done this throughout my career, is getting that coaching making the ask, you know, informally or formally asking for, you know, executive coaching uh, when you maybe rise to that level within your firm to get that support and feedback, 
mentorship uh, and you know, both peers, like Marcella was saying, the network of moms, the network of friends from WashU, from college, uh, different stages and places in your life can be incredibly valuable. Then also that sponsorship, um, having somebody that can pull you up and pull you along. And when decisions are being made in the room, you know what's happening there. You have someone that has your back um, and, is, and is helping you have your voice be heard again in that authentic way. And I think, you know, you're hitting on, when you talk about mentorship, I mean, there's no, there's no getting around it. We all understand how important mentorship is for, for young women in the workplace. Um, and I think my next question here is, it's kind of a, it's a bigger question here, but I think my first part of it is, how would you advise a young woman who's entering the workforce about negotiating that balance of building relationships, finding a mentor, and um, you know, engaging in networking, professional growth, without coming off as maybe too nice or alternatively too assertive and risking respect, um, you know. And so, if somebody wanted to achieve success at your level, you know, what when it comes to networking and finding a mentor, what strengths, skills should they focus on developing? How should they how should they make that happen? And um, Aaron, we'll go ahead and we'll keep it with you if you don't mind. I didn't unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> zoom, zoom error there, user <laughs> error. Um, no, I mean I think it's an excellent question, Stacey, and and, and a, a balance of you know for folks earlier in their careers, throughout throughout our careers, even as you become mm -hmm. more senior, it, it's it's that constant. Um, struggle and and trying to find that that balance that networking that professional growth, um, you know I'd say a couple of things that you know particularly and this may be true for the other industries but I think in finance and investing you you need to make sure you're technically strong and proficient uh, for sure and can master all of those areas and facets of the job um, so no one's questioning your chops there or see you walk in the room and think you know you're not the person that's crunched the numbers or that put the book together and can go frontwards and backwards through the through the model but uh, you know at the same time I think pe people maybe don't and women don't develop or um, lean into perhaps some of the skills that might even come more naturally around persuasion um, and advocation right because at the end of the day we're all probably selling something uh, you know, even me and my seat as an investor, I'm still trying to convince, uh, you know, my principal or my investment committee to move capital to the ideas that, that, that I think are worthy of our dollars, right? Um, so you have to persuade, you have to motivate, and you have to be able to inspire people. And so I think developing those skills um, and, you know, tapping into networks, mentors and partners to sort of test and help you do that on top of the technical uh, skills is, is vitally important. I think that's really interesting because in a way it's almost, um, it's almost like young women are better suited finding a mentor that can help them in those areas, right? Regardless of gender, that can help them in the persuasion, um, the, those leadership elements and kind of worry a lot less about the hard skills that you need to bring to the table because those sort of come with time and, and training that uh, that's not necessarily what we need in a mentor. Um, Marcella, what do you think on that one? You know, I, I echo Erin's um, comments, right? Build a support network, find sponsors, find mentors, find peers, find friends who are supportive and help one another. And I, I, would, uh, one, one, I would be remiss if I don't mention this, men too. Right? We should not forget that men have been part of breaking down these barriers and giving us access. Uh, I joke with my kids that uh, when we talk about gender inequality, that professionally, I have been raised by white males. Uh, there were no females or Hispanics along the way. There were only white males. And it is these white males who gave me the opportunity, access, yeah. challenged me, supported me. They had difficult conversations and they helped me rise. So I think as women, we need to be willing and open to hear that criticism or that feedback, constructive from both men and women. Sometimes there may not be females around to guide you, right? So I think don't be afraid of seeking guidance and advice and constructive feedback. It doesn't have to be females. I know Anne in, in the environment, uh, male dominated, I working at the Federal Reserve prior to Centene, that was a, the research and banking world is a male dominated environment. So I think being open to feedback, asking questions, and uh, and then seeking constructive um, 
feedback is important. Thank you. And, you know, um, and I'm actually, I'm going to ask you, Kalia, the very same question, but I think that that's such a beautiful tie-in because in reality, what's happening in the sports field, and you're such an advocate for young girls in sports, right? And so um, can you give us your insight on the importance of mentorship for young women and what, what they get out of being coached versus, you know, necessarily trying to coach themselves? Yeah, I, it's twofold. So uh, early in my career and, and still ongoing, what I, I pride myself most is relationships. Uh, we, we have this running joke of, you know, a lot of people love to collect business cards uh, and they collect these business cards and they'd be like, well, I know so-and-so. And the, the joke is, well, I know Beyonce, but she doesn't know me. And so that's not a relationship. That's not someone you can pick up the phone and, and ask them, uh, you know, and send an email, you have to build uh, with multiple communication and put yourself out there, especially when you're trying to reach out to senior level executives who are incredibly busy. And so what I really did a good job was staying on people's radars. And it's a difference of bugging people and staying on a radar and following up. Most of the time, I know I am incredibly grateful when someone sends me a follow-up, if I've missed your email and two, three weeks have gone by and you circle back with me and say, hey, I just want to stay on your radar, didn't want this to, and I'm like, oh, great, thank you for sending me that email because now it puts it back top of mind. Um, and the other component to that is it's watching women who have been at the C-suite level. You know, uh, we've shared a lot of data and stats so far. And one of my favorite is 94% of women in the C-suite level have played sports. 52% of those women played collegiate sports. That's an incredible majority of women who are athletic, who are competitive. And I love for women who tell me that they're not sports fans. If you've been to a sporting event, if you've watched a game of any sort, guess what? You're a sports fan. Uh, and so all of the, the things, if you're working out, if you're walking that competitive edge, no one is waking up being like, I hope I'm last in the race today and I want to be nothing, not close to great. No one ever says that. Uh, so you're competitive in, in whatever that looks like for you. And I think that's something for those emerging who are looking, put yourself out there. It's going to be sometimes uncomfortable. Uh, networking is not always fun, uh, especially when you're not in the mood. But again, you have to coach yourself into being open. Okay, so I'm hearing find mentors that, that can coach you in areas and softer skills, right? And persuasion and leadership and motivating others. I'm hearing um, make those relationships genuine and um, to, stay, to stay on top of it, to make sure that, that you're, you have the share of mind that you deserve to have. Um, okay, and so believe it or not, we are coming up on the close of, of our formal session here before we move into a Q&A. And so I'm going to um, wrap this up maybe with some lighter fare, if you don't mind. I just have one more question, and we'll kind of call this, you know, call it a speed round, if you will. And we'll start with Anne. Um, the question is, what is the best career advice you've ever ignored or the worst career advice you've ever taken? And either way, what was the lesson you learned from that? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that uh, I've been told throughout my career, especially when it comes to what job you're going to get next, where you're going, somebody always says, well, we'll take care of that. You know, there's a system. The company has a system. You know, they know you. They know you're out there, et cetera. And, um, and what I've learned, you know, throughout my career and jumping through various jobs and also changing companies is, you own your career, you own the opportunities that you create for yourself. And, uh, and so, you know, when people tell you that, and, you know, the system, or, you know, you can apply on a job or whatever, you know, really think through, is this what I want? Is this where my passion is? And am I going to be good at it? Because that's probably the best way to approach your career as you go forward. Thank you. Marcella, how about you? Uh, well, they say employees don't leave companies, they leave bosses. So perhaps the best career advice that I've ignored a few times throughout my professional journey was not leaving a position where I did not feel supported by my boss. So I would advise um, women watching, choose a job where you feel supported and that you're being set up for growth and development. We spend a third or more of our lives at work and it should not be torture. It should be an environment that is engaging and motivating. I would say find a boss who is your sponsor and your champion and is invested as well in your development, even if that means that eventually one day you will outgrow your role 
and perhaps leave the position and the company. That is courageous leadership and it is really important. So if you don't have a good connection or relationship with your boss, I would advise move on. Also, it's not a, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So it's okay to pace yourself and have some patience. But again, I, th I think that that connection and feeling uh, supported um, around professional development and coaching, those are cr critical throughout your career journey. Love that. Kalia, how about you? One of my favorite pieces of career advice um, has 100% been play to your strengths. Play to your strengths, gravitate to the things that you are naturally good at, that naturally get you excited um, and that the money will come because that, that's true. Uh, I think especially for our young professionals who are going to be emerging uh, post-graduation, uh, you think that you're supposed to come out and it's like, oh, I graduated six figures, here I come. And that's not how it works. Uh, it is a building process and you have to be patient. Uh, and the, the last piece I would add to that is you're all incredibly bright. You're already, you're already smart and equipped, but listen, um, no one wants the, the person to where every time you say something, you say, but, but, but uh, just listen, listen. And even if you think you already know, uh, take the good, discard the bad. Uh, it is one thing that I think will incredibly help you uh, in not only our current careers, but your career to come. Yeah, and I think so many times it's, you know, we think we know, but in reality, it's, you don't have any idea what's in the other person's head and you do need to take the time to listen. Um, Erin, we'll wrap this one up with you if you don't mind. Sure. So I'll, I'll share two, uh, two things. One, uh, I had a, a, a manager tell me once uh, as an opportunity was, was offered in our group to go overseas. And he said, well, don't, don't do that because it's not clear how you're going to get back. And so I think it was a, about a, a lesson in risk taking uh, and limiting yourself uh, in advance. And I didn't end up raising my hand for that opportunity. The colleague that did uh, ended up, cut, you could argue she got stuck, but she got stuck in another job that was actually much more interesting overseas and then still made her way back to the US. From what I've gathered, staying in touch with over the years, all the richer for the experience. So I think as Anne and others have said, you make your own luck, you make your own opportunity. Don't limit yourself um, just because someone says, well, you're gonna get stuck there. You won't have a way back. You won't have a way out of that position. The second um, thing is maybe for folks earlier in their career, I had a boss tell me once, well, you know, an o MBA is overrated and put, this is not a plug for Wash U and any of and Olin programs, but that an MBA is overrated, particularly if you aren't changing fields. I, I fundamentally disagree with that. I think you have to decide whatever graduate certificate, CFA, CFP, whatever it might be for your industry, pursue that if, if, if you see a path for yourself. And again, don't um, let's, you know, the fact that you do plan to maybe stay in the same industry limit you from what would be enormous connections and opportunities by taking a step back or out of the workforce for, you know, one year, two years to pursue that, uh, to, to pursue that program. I'm obviously biased. I know there are others with masters on the, on the panel as well. And, and I think I wouldn't be where I was, I am right now, if I had followed that advice. And I would say too, I don't necessarily, you know, like you said, you have to decide what that work, what that is for you. Um, but undeniably, the world just keeps changing and growing, and there's so much more to learn. And if you're not on top of it, you will kind of get left behind in that respect. Um, so, panel, thank you so much for sharing your personal experiences and these wonderful insights, which um, have sparked some great questions from our audience. So, I'm going to go ahead and turn to the Q and A portion of today's panel. Um, so audience, if you guys have questions, go ahead and drop them into the Q&A panel. But um, our first one has been sitting here for a little while and it comes from Erica Jowett Hurst. Um, and her question is, I'm hearing things like moving towards 50-50 men, women with respect to employee demographics. In what ways should we consider who's applying for positions? For example, in technical fields are 50% of applicants women. And so, yeah, I think this is a great question. It relates to what does the applicant pool look like? And so does anybody have a thought on this? Anne, how about you? Yeah, Stacey, I'm happy to talk about this one because this is one that I spend a lot of time working on. Um, unfortunately, no, 50% of the applicants are not women. 
Uh, we are seeing more and more women gravitating toward technical fields, thanks to all the STEM work that's going on. So science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, at Shell, we have extended outreach programs going all the way down to elementary and middle school to start getting people excited about these types of roles. And so we spend a lot of time, both in my current business group, but also as a company, doing a really large outreach program to touch the local community of children. We do a lot of mentoring of high school aged um, uh, candidates as well. And then in college, we have the active recruiting programs, you know, that go across the country. So it's something that we've determined that if you don't get people excited when they're quite young, it's hard to get the people to stay all the way in the technical um, fields all the way through to a full career. So, um, so it's something that we're quite passionate about, and we're spending quite a bit of money in the community to, uh, to shore up. It is interesting. Uh, it's a great question. And I wonder that so often when we talk about gender parity of, okay, well, what was, what was that applicant pool? Um, does anybody else have a thought on this? I would love to add to that. Uh, it's very interesting uh, in the world of sports and men's professional sports, as well as women's. It's, you know, clearly within front office positions, you just don't nearly have enough women uh, who apply. And mm -hmm. that it goes back to shoot your shot and, and widening uh, and growing the, the group of applicants uh, for women to see themselves in those positions. Uh, and a, a huge proponent of that is also putting it back on the organizations uh, and especially franchises to make sure that we're recruiting, uh, that we're engaging in the community to broaden that, that, that net of saying, hey, here's an opportunity for you. Here's what we're looking for and kind of building out that applicant profile. Uh, but that's something I, I'm a huge proponent of, of, of getting young women immediately to see the opportunity, uh, not on the court, not on the field, but in the front office, in the positions where we have leadership and influence. Thank you. Maybe I'll add to this, you know, in Centene, as I said, 75% of our workforce are female, but that was not the case at the Fed with economic research and banking. I, I do think even now, especially back when I was at the Fed, the pool was definitely not 50-50, I mean, by far. And I would be surprised if, if it is 50-50 now. I, I just don't think that's the case. At Centene, in particular on technology, our numbers for women are high, maybe in the 40%, uh, but we're not quite there yet. And uh, we support many programs around STEM and technology for young girls. Uh, Code Girl is one of them. But, but again, as Anne mentioned, right, how are we investing in youth so that we're opening their minds and uh, interesting them in those areas that are not represented uh, by women? Thank you. Um, I'm going to move to our next question here, which um, is how has addressing the double burden of being Black and a woman improved in the workplace? And historically, the Black woman's burden of race has been neglected or left out of the process of women's rights and coalitions with white women. Does anyone want to touch on this one real quickly? I was like, well, take a stab or... Yeah. or <laughs> no, no, that was a, that was a yeah. little bit of question. So you are going to keep that one first, Erin. I'll, I'll let uh, you... Okay, least. thanks, Clea. I, I was kind of looking out of the corner of my eye, like which, which one of us maybe should start. Um, no, I mean, I think that's a very much a valid question. And... Um, you know, that, that there are efforts that have been made, I think, to you know, call out that intersectionality, um, particularly within the investment field, you know, where I, where I spend my time, um, you know, in programming and um, groups that, you know, maybe originally started, I can think of one that's focused on bringing more women into venture um, that originally was pretty much all white and Asian women. And then there was a conscious effort to bring more BIPOC uh, women into that organization and make sure that their voices were heard, both at the decision making kind of upper echelons, but also just in the, the membership of the of the group. So I think it's it's something that's being acknowledged where maybe it wasn't before, um, and that there are efforts in play, but it's it's definitely an issue. I think it's a, a huge proponent. Uh, you know, I, I have a an amazing network of um, white women and other women of color, but particularly to my white female colleagues. Uh, asking them to be allies, asking them to use their voice and champion and sponsor women of color. 
Uh, you know, it, it's great when our male counterparts are, of course, in a position to do that. But when we talk about feminism and we talk about us being a team uh, and being in this together, that includes all of us. And I think that's something that uh, when you're in a position of power, when you're in a position of influence, it is necessary for you to use your power for good. Um, and not be uncomfortable that it might knock you off your chair, but know that you're going to be supported just as much by bringing someone else into the fold that's not only qualified, uh, but ready to be in a position of leadership next to you and not just under you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I have a great question here. And um, if anyone wants to take this, would love to hear of a failure that catapulted a panel member to a win. We could probably all jump at that. We kind of all smiled at that one. Uh, I, I would Which take it failure first. to pick, right? Which failure to pick? <laughs> Great point, Erin. Uh, I'll, I'll take the lead and I know it'll be a domino effect because none of us are, are perfect. We, we are still learning and growing. Um, and I'm a big proponent of failing forward. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to look back. Um, I don't live in this space of woulda, shoulda, coulda. Um, and, and trying to remain as present as possible. But I, I always think back to like my first, like kind of biggest failure in my book that really was like, all right, I gotta do more. And it goes back to my first surge game. Uh, you know, taking on this crazy leap of faith at 23 to buy a basketball team and convincing people that women's sports are important in a baseball city has been a challenge within itself. Uh, and I remember when we had our first game, uh, the seating capacity was just shy of 5,000 tickets. And I kid you not, I printed 5,000 tickets because I was like, of course, sell out. First game, no doubt. Uh, now, mind you, it wasn't the attendance that we set out, but we set record attendance anyway with 1,300 fans uh, and very early on of just grassroots of being in the community. It was a hard lesson to throw away those additional uh, 33,000 plus tickets. Uh, but what I learned in that was growth. What else do we continue to do? And instead of looking at it as a, a defeating moment, it was like there's work to be done. Uh, and I think that's something that I've carried with me is like when you have a goal and you don't reach it, that's okay. You know that now you, you learn, you pivot, you've adjusted uh, to be able to make sure that you made some changes to get the job done. I love that. Um, Marcella, do you have one? I'll share two quite significant failures. <laughs> Number one, I started my uh, student journey studying actuarial science uh, and very close to finishing the degree, I realized it wasn't for me. It was to, it's applied math to insurance and uh, I just found it just too dry. And uh, I took an economics class and I fell in love with economics because it's math applied to human behavior. So almost finished. I took a turn and uh, changed degrees to economics. And then my second failure was when I was pursuing my graduate degree at WashU, I was a mother of little ones, they were four years old, who would cry in the car as they were dropping me off for my classes. So I just couldn't take it anymore. And I decided I was gonna quit the program and uh, go look for a job instead. And when I, I got a job at the Fed returning, I, I, I think I've worked at the Fed three times, but at that point I told uh, my boss, I'm, I'm quitting the degree, I'm quitting the graduate degree, I can't do it. And he said, no, no, you're not. Uh, you, you can continue and just take your time, et cetera. And uh, so the Fed supported me in that journey. It took a little while, but I, I finished it. And I remember on my graduation from my master's, Jim Bullard, CEO of the Fed said, your education will serve you well. And he was right. So my education served me well. So it's a journey. Again, it's a journey. It's okay to make mistakes. And how about you? Yeah, I was actually um, thinking because it's it's one of those of how many do you choose from? But um, <laughs> you know, maybe um, maybe switching tactics a little bit. I'll just talk about you know business failure. Um, cause we often don't use examples of, you know, where we make mistakes in our job. And, um, and so, you know, three years ago, three to four years ago, when I was running Shell's aviation business, this is jet fuel. We were talking about how do we make, um, air travel more sustainable. 
And we started down a path to, you know, think through all the different ways we could do that. And one of the things that we, um, or what I was uh, working with my team on was, you know, where do you insert yourself in the process and where in the value chain should you play? It's a very different value chain. It's not a traditional oil and gas value chain. And at the time, um, the decision that I took was around um, jumping in more kind of aggregating up uh, fuels from all sorts of um, startup companies that were trying to get into sustainable aviation fuel. When the reality is we should have just taken the big bet to you know, put money on the table and get backward integrated into sustainable fuels. And so we spent, we wasted probably two years, you know, trying to figure out how this works. But the reality of it was, I mean, this is similar to entrepreneurial startup businesses. You kind of have to go in, you have to learn the market, you have to fail a bit, and then you have to go forward. And now today, if we look at, um, you know, the position that Shell's taken in sustainable aviation fuels, we've invested in all sorts of companies, including um, some women and minority owned companies in this space. And we're supplying uh, sustainable aviation fuel at many of the major airports around the world. But um, could we have gotten there, you know, a bit faster? We probably could have. And it was around uh, slowing down and, you know, really doing networking to think through um, how the pro how, what problem are you trying to solve and, you know, who can help you solve that? Because to be honest, it was something we didn't know anything about. It was a new area for us. And, uh, and I think that's something we often don't want to do at this level is to ask questions and learn. And, um, and it was really the way we should have, or I should have approached the problem. Thank you. And um, panel, we are at time. So Erin, I guess you're off the hook for this one. Uh, but I wanna thank you again for being here and sharing, sharing with us your collective knowledge and experience. It's so incredibly valuable. There are many more questions um, in our chat ready to roll. But if I would tell our audience, if you are interested in further connecting with any of today's panelists, please note the slides that are rolling on your screen right now that contain the speaker's contact information. Um, you should also be seeing slides for ways to connect and engage with the various WashU Olin offices and programs. We absolutely encourage you to capture that contact information and reach out, whether it's to the speakers or to the offices for further engagement. Um, before we go, I'm going to introduce Carrie Donnelly from WashU Olin's Graduate Admissions Office, who will share a few updates and close out our program. Thank you so much. Carrie. Thank you, Stacy. Good evening, everyone. As Stacy mentioned, I'm Carrie Donnelly, and I'm with WashU Olin's Graduate Admissions team. We've heard from some amazing women leaders today and gained insights from their stories, lessons learned, business philosophies and how their values have impacted their decision making. I wanna thank them all for their time and for inspiring us. WashU Olin's newly reimagined executive MBA also focuses on leadership. Our values-based data-driven approach to leadership is woven throughout the EMBA program curriculum from Go Week through the final capstone project. Students meet with certified executive leadership coaches throughout the program and even afterwards to develop a personalized, actionable leadership plan in their own higher purpose statements. We've also launched a data-driven decision-making course to help leaders understand the ways technology affects business and how to build teams that harness the power of technology and data. We're very excited about our reimagined executive MBA and we're confident this highly ranked program will produce great business leaders who aim to change the world for good. I'd like to invite you to learn more about our executive MBA at an information session on Thursday, March 25th. You can register using the short URL on your screen now, and we're also sharing a link in the chat. For those of you who expressed an interest in learning more about our executive MBA when you registered for this event, you'll receive an email invite later today. Again, thank you all for attending today's annual She Sweet event. I hope we're able to put into practice some of the sound advice you heard from our extraordinary panel. We invite you to join us at our next Leadership Perspectives event on Wednesday, April 7th, where you'll hear from WashU Owens' own Dean Mark Taylor and General John Allen, the president of the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. We're bringing together these two renowned leaders to discuss leadership in business, academia, govern government, and the military. We hope to see you there. Until then, we wish you well. Have a wonderful evening.